And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where we are approaching the All-Star break. Two nights of games left, and then we are there. And the MVP race is officially on fire. And to talk us through it, guide us through it, one of our colleagues who just wrote a wonderful story on maybe the front runner, and I'm, I'm not even sure anymore, James Harden, ESPN Insider, Texas extraordinaire, Tim McMahon. How you doing? Howdy. Hey, do I get my theme song played when I come on here? I know it's, it's been banned from the Hoop Collective. We don't we don't have those kind of bells and whistles here. You know, this is okay. a, this is a shoestring production. You know, I come <laughs> I come in here and in this studio, it's all the all the uh, uh, the MMA stuff for the MMA podcast is up here. We got nothing. We got no we got no low post low post accoutrement. We got nothing. Sorry. All right, that, that's fine. We'll just we'll just make do. I've got a nice up and under, so we'll, we'll make do with that. A McHale style up and under is that your go to move? Uh, I've got I've got that good old fashioned old man can't jump game. So yeah, I got a little bit of that. I used to imitate McHale in the driveway. That was my guy. The up and under with the up and under was my move. That was my guy. Um, there you go. So every once in a while, I like to bring someone on just because they wrote a fun story, and you wrote a fun story. I believe it was over the weekend on James Harden, in which Mike D'Antoni used the word gonads, which really, I mean, that's got to rank as one of the highlights of your career. When he said the word gonads, did you start laughing and say, well, that's going in? Oh, absolutely. And and I and I appreciate gonads. I, I prefer the term cojones, but I know you I do. Think gonads is, is West Virginian for, for cojones. It's a direct translation. Um, and so, and look, as you know, <laughs> you end up laughing pretty much every time you talk to Mike D'Antoni. Uh, he's a fun dude. To, uh, to, to deal with for what we do. Um, and th- this story was about fun. It was about the fun in James Harden's game, which I would say, uh, you can, you can disagree with me if you'd like. I would say the vast majority of non-rocket NBA fans don't see James Harden's game as being much fun. He is as unpopular a dominant scorer as I think we've seen in a long, long time, there's the, oh, all he does is hunt fouls and whining about the walks and this, that, and the other. And I think for all the hate, you know, people are missing out on a, a lot of artistry in terms of the step back, some of the crazy passes that he makes, just the, the rare, I mean, maybe unprecedented ability to, uh, to create one-on-one. But, for whatever reason, he's not a beloved figure uh, in you know in, in buildings around the league. Do you? So the, the impetus for this story is the idea, and this is why it was kind of a fun story. Like, do you like watching James Harden play? Why don't people, more people anyway, like watching James Harden play? Um, do you like watching him play? It seems like you do. I I do. And look, uh, is it always like is every game from him pretty? No, absolutely not. But you can, same was the case with Kobe, who was beloved as a as an ISO guy. Same is the case with with Allen Iverson, and, and on down the list. I I love the fact that he has completely just obliterated the definition of what's a good shot for James Harden. Hunting twenty eight foot step back shots that would get ninety nine point nine percent of NBA players, much less you know anybody else. Bench. I mean, those are the shot. That's his go-to move. It's his version of Kareem Skyhook. And yeah, I, I do find it entertaining to watch a guy. You know, you know what's coming. The defender knows it's coming. Boom, boom, boom. You know, puts the ball on a on a string, and after seven or eight, nine, ten, twelve dribbles, is is launching a, a, a step back from twenty-eight feet and hitting a high percentage. That to me is entertaining. And then you know, especially he hasn't had Capella. Uh, recently and, and Freed's a, a nice fill in, but it's not the same as that chemistry has with Capella. Not the same hands, not, you know, quite as uh as long and, and all that stuff. But Harden as a passer, especially with Capella, I, I, I do think is is absolutely beautiful basketball. And you know, some of the forty five, fifty foot dimes he puts that uh hit Capella in traffic uh for dunks, uh, you know, I I mean I, yeah, I, I do enjoy watching those. Those are the passes that take Gonads is Mike D'Antoni yes, they are. said. I think his passing is actually underrated. Um, and, and I guess it's not underrated because the, 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 the hardcore fans know, but just the sheer variety of them. And like, I, I've written this before, like some of them, some of them, his release point is so low to the ground and they're, they bounce so low off the ground mm-hmm. 
be to to avoid arms reaching down to get them that I, I've compared it to like he's almost like skipping rocks on a pond like it, it, just the the sheer variety of what he can do as a passer and now that Paul is back and we'll talk about CP who doesn't look the same obviously um, yeah his Harden's last couple of games he's normalized a little bit the balance between just going one on one for step backs and drives and more pick and roll, more passing, more a little bit more variety. We could talk about whether that's good or bad for the only matchup they care about, which is the Warriors. Um but I feel like with Chris Paul on the floor, his game now finds a more natural uh balance. I fall on the spectrum where I, I, I heard um that I think it was Saturday night they had that the the Thunder Rockets game where both Harden and Paul George went bananas. Um and Van Gundy said Van Gundy expressed my take on Harden, which is I enjoy watching him to a moderate degree. I can appreciate the footwork and the stop and start and the insanity of the shots. He's making step back threes in the corner. Like you can yeah. you can barely stay no. in you can barely stay in bounds in the corner, let alone take a step back and stay in bounds only, and make a shot. Not only that, when he gets the ball and he's got a guy in his face in the corner. It's funny, I sit next to Jonathan Fagan from the Houston Chronicle a lot during games, and we'll, we'll just kind of mumble to each other, like, here comes the step back. Uh, good defenders, no space, doesn't matter. He's going to get that step back off, and he's going to hit a lot of them. Um, but, but what Jeff said is sort of the repetitiveness of it does get monotonous for me after a while, and that's why stylistically I'm happy that Paul is back, so there's a little bit more variety. Like, I like when they play a little bit faster. D'Antoni actually has some really nice out of time outsets or he comes off mm-hmm. two screens and gets a handle. Like I like when they toss stuff like that and um because the other stuff gets but but a little monotonous. But to your point, um I don't think these things happen in real time and we write about them. You've written multiple pieces about the step back three. I just think it's hard to appreciate how revolutionary the shot is. Like this it's completely changed the game and it actually is sort of a natural evolution from what Curry did four or five years ago when he was exploding into the MVP race. He would use the step back when big guys would get switched on to him. He'd, he'd dribble in, get them backpedaling, and then step back for a three. And that fake in kind of opened up the space he needed as a smaller guy who mm. brings the ball up from like a – he sort of brings it a little lower before he releases it than Harden. He needed that space. Harden is like – well, I don't really even need. I don't really need to do this big fake. I can do this step back against anybody anytime I want. Like if I can make that forty percent of the time, that's a good shot. So he's made. Last time I checked, a couple of days ago, he's made a hundred and sixty nine step back threes already this season. He's on pace for two hundred and sixty step back threes. Right. To put that in step perspective. Backs. To put that in perspective, in two thousand thirteen, Steph Curry, revolutionary player. Led the entire league with 272, like, total threes. So James Harden is hitting step back threes at a rate that five years ago we would have looked at and said, well, we've never seen anything like that before for like overall threes. And teams have no idea what to do. No clue. The only team that had a coherent game plan was the Bucks, where they told Eric Bledsoe, or Eric Bledsoe told them, you're going to essentially, um, piggyback James Harden's, uh, right, uh, left shoulder. To force mm-hmm. him right, you're going to play behind him. So if he steps back, he's literally stepping into you, and you're going to force him to drive. Everyone else has given up. No one has any idea what to do. I've had coaches on two teams tell me separately, unrelated. We just told our guys, don't even pursue. Don't, don't, don't. When he steps back, you stand still. Put your hand on as high as you can. Reach for the sky. Reach for the sky. But don't leap forward because you're going to foul him, and then he's going to get a exactly. four-point play or a three-shot. Teams have no idea what to do and he, it, it's it's completely bonkers and no matter what you think of it stylistically it is a shot that has more or less broken basketball yeah, and, and by the way with the bucks it helps when you can funnel him into robin lopez or i'm sorry brooke lopez and uh and and the greek freak <laughs> you know when you got those long arms in there but it, you know it's fun. there's obviously a ton of oh all he does is hunt fouls and look, I wrote a whole story on all the little tricks and tactics he has to get to the free throw line, which to me, that's a skill. Now, that's not a fun skill to watch, but it is a skill. 
No, they're team DV- Houston has always been team DVR for me in the Harden era. Just the, they're the yeah, best. You, you, I can they're see the that. best. They're the best DV- Particularly when they had Dwight and they were just at the foul line constantly. You just you had to do the fast forwards. I I, I can see that. I don't have that luxury while I'm covering the games. Um, but you know the he. I don't feel like he's hunting threes on a step backs. He's trying to make step back threes. It's the most difficult shot in basketball to defend because not only is he stepping back. But he has it at every single angle. I mean, he can go, you know, whatever, you know, diagonal to the left, diagonal to the right, straight back, you know, side to side, whatever you want. So guys get caught in funny uh, positions. You know, Mike Malone, actually Denver has, I would say Denver defends him as well as anybody. Uh, Mike Malone certainly <laughs> is proud of that fact and can offer some statistical support. And that's the one, the one team that has held him to only 30 during the streak and it took a, a a crazy leaning three late and a blowout loss to get there but malone was saying he tells his guys do not challenge it you know in his face you you have to play the step back three to the side if you if you close straight out on it he's going to be going to the line again and again and again um it's it's really fascinating to watch teams figure out i mean harden has always been interesting to me for that, for, for the reason of it's, it, he's the most fun, I think, to watch how the other team game plans against him. And that mm. was, that, that really crescendoed to me in the Spurs series two seasons ago that the Rockets ended up losing when the Spurs toggled through a couple things, but really settled on a baseline way of defending him, which was just wait at the rim, force him to drive and wait at the rim. Um, among other things that other teams have since tried to copy, like a lot of what the Bucks did was essentially a more extreme version of that. Um, and, and I just think he, it's fascinating to watch other teams game plan for him. Listeners, you know, I love things that save me time and buying tickets to sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, whatever was one of those things that got to just be a little too time consuming. Oh my God, there are dozens of sites on the secondary market that I forget to check that one. What if I'm getting a a worse deal than I could be getting? What if I forgot to check that other one? And all of a sudden, half an hour, an hour has gone by. SeatGeek solves all those problems. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can find the seats you want at the price you want to pay for all of those kind of events. It's super easy to use it as a color-coded system. Green dots for good deals, red dots for less good deals. Figuring out the location of the seats are is easy. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. It should be your go-to ticket source for everything. Sports, concerts, comedy, Broadway shows, and best of all, my listeners, you people get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app. Enter promo code low, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast, promo code low for 10 bucks off your first SeatGeek purchase. That can be a significant chunk of a, of an NBA ticket or a football game or whatever. SeatGeek, life's an event. We have the tickets. Let's talk briefly about the Rockets. Um, the Rockets are fifth in the West, well tied for fourth with Portland, 33 and 23. How good are the Rockets when they get fully held? I'll just, I'll leave it there. How good do you think the Rockets are? You know, I, I still think that if the Rockets are fully healthy, that they have as good of a chance of anybody of challenging the Warriors, which is to say not a very good chance at all. But, uh, you know, if, if, if Harden can be this historically dominant, if Capella can be the, you know, the force that he was before he, uh, you know, before he hurt his thumb and he'll be back just right after the All-Star break, then, then I still think they are. Now, look, they're nowhere near as good as last year. Chris Paul is not the same player, the same, you know, outstanding co-star, co-superstar that he was last year. You know, we'll see how Shumpert fits in, but obviously the drop-off from Trevor Ariza to, to James Ennis you know, that didn't work. They've been very fortunate to add in the, you know, really early buyout market two, uh, you know, two guys in, in Austin Rivers and Kenneth Free that have addressed their depth that were absolutely necessary to get through the stretch without CP3, to get through the stretch without, uh, without Clint Capella. But they went from a really, really good defensive team last year to a pretty bad defensive team. 25th right uh, now. 25th and yeah. 29th in defensive rebounding, which is a weakness that we thought they would correct, and they took some schematic um, 
adjustments to try and correct. Like there were some switches. They, they went from switch everything to switch most things, but not things that are really going to murder us on the defensive glass and try to avoid switching certain people on certain other people. And it hasn't worked. They're still terrible. Yeah. I mean, and, and so that's the thing. If James Harden is this historically elite, I think they've still got at least a, a, a puncher's chance. But the other thing about Harden being this historically elite with that kind of a usage rate is, look, this is a guy who has run out of gas in the playoffs before, and that absolutely has to be considered a significant concern. Um, absolutely. And and you hear people poo-poo that, you know, everyone's tired. You know, how do we know sports science is an uncertain thing? How do we know? Okay, well, you just, you just, you know, you watch them play the last two playoffs. And I, and I do think, well, I don't know that I think, but he, he, um, it, he's had great playoff moments too. People, people forget a yeah. lot of those, including dating to Oklahoma City. The Spurs still um, tremble in in fear over what he did to them when the Thunder made the finals. Um, but you know, he is not. He does not have the best resume of responding when things start to not go their way. Like when when they get hit in the mouth a little bit. He does not have the best resume in the biggest moments of, of, of rising up and taking his team with him against the best teams. But, you know, you could, did, he, did he wear down? I think what you're saying certainly has to be considered a contributing factor. And between Mike D'Antoni and James Harden, there does not seem to be a lot of will to change that. There is occasional um, words to indicate that they are aware of it and might change it and might do this and that. But nothing really ever seems to happen. And truthfully, this year between Gary Clark and Daniel House and all these random dudes off the street that they're playing, they just haven't had the luxury of, of, of take, giving him much time off. Right, and look, with CP3 back now, you can say, okay, well, that affords you a little bit of luxury. Of course, now Austin Rivers is banged up. I think it's just a one-game deal with the elbow, but we'll see. Uh, but they've got to manage CP3's minutes. At that age, look through NBA history, and there is one guy that size who at that age was still an all-star caliber player. That's John Stockton, who was playing 28 minutes a game. CP3 can't be averaging 33, 34 minutes a game, and you have any expectations if he's going to be available for, for, the, for the whole playoffs. I mean, obviously, he's got uh, there's durability issues. That's always going to be a concern. They've got to control his minutes, and you can't manage his minutes that tightly and then try to you know knock down James. James is going to have to play 35 that's where you hope. It's going to be 38. So it's going to be in the uh, in the playoff games that matter. It's going to be 40 plus. I just don't exactly. see any other way. I mean, in the in the, in exactly. the high stakes close playoff games, he's going to have to hit 40. Um, yeah, and do, his and his 40 minutes are are tougher. I would say than maybe anybody else's, just because you know, I mean, the guy dribbles 600 some odd times a game. <laughs> You know, I mean, he's working hard to get those 36, 37, 40, 50, 61 points. Uh, and then, look, we all understand that the, the reputation on defense. But, you know, I mean, he's uh, does he take possessions off? Yes. Everybody who has ever averaged 30-some-odd points per game, uh, I was probably w- would think does. But, you know, the Rockets invite teams to kind of target him in the post where he's actually an elite defender more than holds his own uh he's at least active in terms of steals deflections ranks among the leaders there so it's this ain't like you know the the i think the last dwight year where you know it's just night in night out james is just not giving a crap yeah he he would he would fall into comas on the court like he would just the game would be going on and all of a sudden he would just have a glitch where he stood there staring into space and like not doing anything those are mostly gone um, I think he's, 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 for what he does offensively, I think he's adequate defensively. And as you said, you know, the secret is now out. His post defense is very good. He gets a lot of steals. He's physical. He communicates on switches. He's telling people where to go. He, he is not botching as many switches hardly ever anymore, um, mm-hmm. a, as he was when they first started doing it. I think he's been, for what he does offensively, I think he's been okay defensively. Uh, Ke- Kevin Pelton, our mutual friend and pocket score enthusiast, um, we were in LA a couple weeks ago and, and had a coffee and we both thought then, I asked him, who's the second best team in the West come playoff time? And he said, I think the healthy version of the Rockets still. And I agreed with him then. I said, I think that team is still 
the second best team in the West. Two and a half weeks later, I'm a little bit less convinced. Because, because the, you're looking at Oklahoma City. Well, two things have happened. Number one, Denver isn't going away and they're getting help. Three things. Denver, OKC, if, and we're going to talk about PG. If PG is, if this is Paul George in 2019, they are, they are going to be very good for the rest of the season period. And, and Houston, their defense hasn't improved. And yeah. Chris Paul, Chris, for, to do what they did last year, Chris Paul had an immortal one-on-one season. It, he, yep. he and Harden, their numbers one on one, their isolation numbers, the way they built that offense, it depended on them being immortal. He's mortal this year. His isolation numbers are right. good, but mortal. You can see him who, in, in that. I believe it was in that OKC game. Maybe it was in one of the subsequent games. He had an offensive foul trying to get by a big man on a switch and pushed off of him. I can't remember who it was. And you're like, ooh. Yeah, I was just talking. Well, I won't say who I was talking to, but then that's the thing. I said, look. You know, CP3 is still good, but last year when they got a big switched on to him, it was an automatic bucket. I mean, it was every single time, easy bucket. He is struggling to get separation. You know, there's a lot of times he's settling for, for bad threes or just, you know, not able to, to get a good shot up. And, and you're absolutely right. And, and not only, you know, that, that affects a lot of things. It affects the load on Harden. It affects the, uh, one of the things the Rockets dominated last year was the minutes when Harden sat and CP3 and, uh, you know, CP3 and, and primarily a second unit would just absolutely torch other teams' benches. You know, that, that hasn't been quite the same. Uh, and, you know, I don't know what the answer is there because I don't know that CP3 is going to, you know, magically get that juice back late in the season. Yeah, I mean, their ceiling just isn't as high if he's normal, good player and not all world, all NBA if healthy kind of player working within that scheme. He has four or five of those moments a game where he, just, ooh, ooh, that didn't, that didn't look like him. Ooh, he normally yeah. gets a little more space to uncork that mid range or ooh, you know, he normally gets by that big guy or, or whatever it is. And defensively, I don't think he's been the same. And that's his, that's his calling card as much as anything else is. He's an absolute menace, tenacious, gives no quarter, no matter how much smaller he is on defense. And I, I, I don't think he's been as airtight, um, there too. And, and, you know, this is an obvious one, but when Tucker is on the bench, which really cannot be very often the way they're built, they, yeah. they're playing four guards all the time. They're, they're just, it's either Tucker's at the power forward or they're playing four guards and they're just, they're a little smaller than I would like them to be. And maybe that doesn't matter against the Warriors because I think in Daryl Morey's heart, he, he thinks to beat the Warriors, we're just going to have to go all in on to, to the extremes of what we do well, which is tons of threes and tons of offense, even if it means we're a little small and a little more defensively challenged than we would like. That's our only shot. They're just, you know, when the four guards are small, man, it's just small. And, and the numbers. Oh, I hear you. And, and so here are some numbers. You know, nominally their best lineup is Paul Harden, Tucker, Gordon, Capella. I think that's probably in their in their head. That's their yeah. closing starting and closing lineup. Yeah. Um for the season 109 points per 100 possessions, 115 allowed. They are minus 1 with Paul if you just put Paul and Harden, just their two their their minutes together. They're minus 1 for the season. They're their best groups. Now you could say they haven't been able to get any rhythm. That lineup has only played 130 some minutes. Um, mm-hmm. their best groups just haven't been as good as they need to be. Well, and look, last year, I, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the, their star trio, and I am, I do consider Clint Capella a star, uh, but Harden, CP3, Capella, it was, their net rating was something crazy like plus 12, and, uh, God, I, what was it? They were 50 something and three when all those guys played. It was I mean, like a fake stat. It was like, it was obscene. like fake. Yeah, it was like uh, you couldn't, it couldn't possibly be real. Yeah, and, and, you know, obviously they have not been anywhere close to that kind of dominance. And you could say, well, you know, that part of that's because the downgrading role players around them. Uh, part of that's the, you know, the, the lack of health. I think there was some hangover for everybody early in the season. CP3's been nicked up. You know, early in the season, he was playing with a, a sore elbow. Then, obviously, the hammy, you know, hadn't looked as quick and and blah, blah, blah. And it, it has become uh, just an absolute one-man show with Capella out now with CP3. He's getting back up to at least, 
not the same speed as last year, but he's starting to get a little bit of a rhythm. But still, he missed such a long stretch. It's a it's a one man show like and we Gordon, have not seen in this league in a long time. Gordon is still thirty two percent from three, thirty nine percent overall, forty nine from two. Just hasn't hasn't found it. We keep waiting for him to find it. He'll go two or three games, or okay, it's clicked, and then it just it goes back the other way. He hasn't had his you know Clay Thompson streak work. Clay Thompson, by the way, back to forty percent from three after all the hemming and hawing about. Oh boy, it's a big slump. You know, I don't know what's wrong with Clay. He's going to shoot forty percent from three again. Um, yeah, so where I end on the Rockets is I, I'm not all the way out of where I was two weeks ago where I thought their ceiling is still the second-best team in the West. But to me, um, Denver and Oklahoma City have 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 it probably bypassed them for now a little bit. Now, Denver, the if healthy thing, are they ever going to be healthy? Is Gary Harris ever going to be healthy? I, I don't know. We'll see. Isaiah Thomas is coming back. I'm not sure that helps their team. Um, I don't like that at all because I'm not trying to take minutes from those other young guards. Well, the only thing I'll say is Trey Lyles has been so bad, and he's in my 10 things this week. He's been so bad that there's an argument that you know you can take out him and shift Wancho to the four or play another yeah. guard or something. You can find – you can finagle. You can do some finagling. Um, but – I'm not I, – I, I, as much as I just said, in Oklahoma City has been ridiculous. Now, they've been a little up and down. Their defense has been – is is really up and – I mean, it's mostly up, but they have some down periods where you're like, oof, what's going on? Um, they've been really good. If you told me Houston in, in May is the second-best team in the West, I still wouldn't be surprised. I just am less confident in that than I was two weeks ago. Yeah, and look, you know, if we're going to talk about MVP, obviously Paul George is high up in that conversation. Uh, and I think Jokic has to be in that conversation. If Denver's going to be, you know, if we look up at the end of the season and Denver's a number two seed in the Western Conference, I think he ought to at least be on ballots. I mean, what he, he's the best passing big man in the history of the game. I, I, I don't think that's hyperbole. At least, I mean, at he, least in the history of the game where their best years were not hidden behind uh, the Iron Curtain. Um, and that's Sabonis, yeah, okay. Sabonis right. Okay, in the history of the NBA, then. So, yeah, okay, yeah. pre pre Achilles Sabonis, maybe. Uh, but I mean, you can throw out Walt Wilt's the only one who's ever averaged more assists in a season than, than Jokic is now, or Jokic did last season, or and I think even the season before. And man, that I mean, just the way that he can run the offense from the elbow, from the block, and then I love all the pieces around him. I tell you what, I mean, obviously, you know, they want Gary Harris healthy, but man. I'm fresh off seeing uh, Malik Beasley put 35 on the Rockets and play great defense. You know, Monty Morris is one of the better backup point guards in the league. Their, their guard depth. Yeah, there is no. Everyone keeps with asking the youth me. Is ridiculous. Everyone keeps asking me, like, should Isaiah Thomas take Monty Morris's minutes? No, no, no. That question's been answered. Hell no. No, the Monty Morris has to play. Like, there's no universe where Isaiah Thomas is taking minutes. The guy's been no. too good. It's time for some straight talk, people. Look, you wouldn't spend more to get the exact same thing, would you? No, you would not. Who would? So, when I tell you that Straight Talk Wireless runs on the same 4G LTE networks as the big guys, but charges you a lot less to use them, you see where I'm going with this, right? The $45 unlimited plan from Straight Talk Wireless just got even better. Now get 25 gigs of high-speed data and nationwide coverage on America's largest, most dependable 4G LTE networks for just $45 a month. That's nothing. No contract. That's good, too. Plus, you can pick up the latest smartphones like the Samsung Galaxy S9. So you don't pay more, get more, 25 gigs more, straight talk, wireless, everything for less. Only at Walmart. First 25 gigabytes at high speed, then 2G. See terms at straighttalk.com. Let's talk about the MVP because that's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, This is shaping up to be one of those years. We had one two years ago. When Russ won, it's it's shaping up to be one of those years where it is a just fever pitch surrounding the MVP discussion, and everyone is going to be very angry at you, no matter how you vote, except for one fan base who's going to consider you a good person because you voted for their guy. It's <laughs> going to be one of those years, and to me, Paul George has made it a three man race. It's not. Yeah. I, I think he's. I think he's reached the point. Where it's not, oh, it's Harden and Giannis and like PG's having a good season. He's probably number three. He's averaging 29, 8, and 4 on 46%, 41% from deep on like nine attempts a game. 
eighty something percent from the line, and he might be the favorite for defensive player of the year. He's I was not averaging, say, and he's playing a late defense. Yeah, yep. he, he's not averaging twenty four a game. He's at twenty nine now, and the 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 stat that you're gonna hold, you're gonna pin his uh, candidacy on, is the Thunder are plus eleven per hundred possessions with PG on the floor, minus eleven when he's off the floor for a total net rating of plus twenty two which is the best of any player in the league, and it's not even close. I think number right. two is like Danny Green at 18 or something like that. Now, we can talk about um, what that says about teammates and roster context and all that, but the other bottom line is when Russ plays without PG, they're like minus nine. Per, they're awful, and in the inverse, they're great. I think he's made it a three-man race, and if you told me right now, despite James Harden scoring a gazillion points— and despite the Bucks having the best record in the NBA, the best stats in the NBA, the best everything in the NBA, you wanted to vote Paul George MVP? I'm not saying I would vote for him now. I don't know who I would vote for now. I think that's a perfectly legitimate argument. He has been that good. You know what Paul George is? Paul George is Kevin Durant. Paul George has become what Kevin Durant was yeah. in Oklahoma City. Because if you look at the way their team evolved, over the last three years of the Russ-KD partnership, and it was very intentional, Oklahoma City shifted more of its offense to Russ on the ball, KD, secondary attacker, comes off screens, posts up, carries the offense in crunch time if need be. But in terms of ball control, pick and roll volume, it was Russ's offense and KD finding his place. And that's why when they traded for Paul George, lots of people, including me, wrote, he is the best facsimile of that Kevin Durant, the the apex number two option in the NBA. That is what Paul George is. And by the numbers, and I'll recite some later, he is exactly what Kevin Durant was in his last year in Oklahoma City to the point that it's uncanny. And that player is an MVP candidate. It sounds like you think he's up there too. Yeah, and to be clear, he is the number one option in OKC. He just, you know, it's Russ's job is becoming more and more about setting up Paul George. And, and Russ... He doesn't hide from that. You know, you heard him uh, the other night during his postgame thing. What do you say? Like, the, the, the good-looking one goes first, the best one goes yeah, last. Yeah, he anointed himself the good-looking one. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> well, it, the, the man, you know, he, he takes a lot of pride in appearance and, and, you know, what he wears to the game and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, yeah, Paul George is absolutely in the conversation. And, look, shout-out to Jokic, Embiid. Pick whichever Warriors candidate you want, whether it's KD or, or Steph. That's a separate conversation. But I agree. It's, it, there's three guys who it, it's looking like it's going to come down to. Uh, Harden is, I mean, what he's doing is historical in, in, in terms of the way he's carrying that offense. The and, and by the way, whine about the style. Look at his efficiency and compare to every other guy in NBA history who's averaged 36-plus per game, and he's the most efficient 36-plus point-per-game scorer Here, in the here's history one, of the game. Here's one for you on Harden. Uh, crunch time. So I, I, I filter crunch time final three minutes of games within three points. Yeah. Harden has played 40-such minutes. He's 18 of 36 from the field, 29 of 33 from the line, 73 total points, number one in the league by a mile. They've all been Giannis in those same minutes. Now there's this percent. The Bucks are winning by so much that Giannis has yeah. less of these high leverage minutes, but he's 10 of 14 from the field, 13 of 16 from the line, 33 total points. PG only 8 of 23 from the field. I mean, these are the, these are the. But PG has had his first real non Gatorade commercial game winner. This year, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and he's been a monster. I mean, sometimes you extrapolate these things like of 30 seconds further out and you you some now the bucket has like these two monstrously important Paul George threes that it didn't have. Um yeah. can I read you some Paul George numbers that I found that I thought were fun? Absolutely. Cuz I'm trying to I'm trying to just sort of put his thing in in perspective. Paul George right now isolations, ready? This is from our fancy second spectrum data. Mhm. Um one point per isolation which is that's borderline immortal. Like if you get over one you're doing very well. On 7.6 per 100 possessions. Durant in his final Oklahoma City season, one point per isolation on 7.7. Almost identical. Hmm. Off screens, so this is when he curls around screens and shoots, 0.98 points per possession on 20 screens a game. KD in his last year was 0.93 on 31. Pick and rolls, 
I mean, Paul George's numbers on the pick and roll are insane. Anytime they run a pick and roll with Paul George, on that possession, the Thunder averaged 1.22 points per possession. That's fourth in the entire league. And if you just isolate the shots where he either shoots or he passes to one guy who shoots, he passes, the guy one pass away shoots, it's 1.08 points. That's 13th. Durant was worse than that, a little bit worse, still very good, but a little bit worse, on almost the exact same number of picks per 100 possessions. 18 for Paul George, 19 for KD in his last year. He has become Kevin Durant, and the pick and roll numbers are crazy good when you consider that sometimes he's on the floor with four dudes who either can't shoot or are treated as guys who can't shoot. And so you freeze the frame where he, where Paul George gets around that screen and gets to the elbow, there is nowhere for him to go. Like the fact that he can score efficiently out of that is crazy. He's taking these three pointers where, you know, if you're guarding him and you get like the screen doesn't even hit you. You do the screen, you're right on his hip. You are touching him. If the big guy drops back, he's just rising up. He doesn't care if you're literally touching him and he's making shots. He's having an absolute, he's become Kevin Durant. Now the tricky thing is, Kevin Durant won the MVP, right? He won the MVP in the year that Russ missed 36 games. And mm-hmm. I don't think that's a coincidence because even as you just said, PG is the number one option, there's this idea that being the number one option isn't enough to win MVP. You have to be the orchestrator. You have to be the guy who controls the possession and the number one option, and he's not going to be that. And I don't think it's a coincidence that KD won the MVP in the year that he had to be that. Does that make any sense? Or or, or Russ won in the year after KD left. Yeah, and, and, and I don't I think I'm not that. saying that's right. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying I think there's a certain number of voters who will say, yeah, but he's the second option. They'll characterize it that way. Yeah, they're testing the sound system here. That's American okay. I like it. It's ambient well. noise. You're in the American Airlines, whatever, whichever, the center of the arena in Dallas, whichever the, the one it center, is. The center, not the, the arenas in, uh, in, in Miami. But, yeah, but if, if I'm, if I'm lobbying for Paul George, I flip that and say, okay, how about two-way dominance? Does that not matter? Because like you said, he's a potential defensive player of the year. I oh, it matters. With, with matters Rudy to me. Gobert, but yeah, and so that, that absolutely matters. Now, Giannis is one hell of a defensive force as well. I mean, and, and I haven't, I have not looked at the, uh, most recent defensive rating rankings. Perhaps you know, where, where are the Bucks and where are the, the Thunder? Bucks are one. Bucks have taken over the lead. I've got so many tabs open and the Thunder are down to three and the Bucks are in the lead by a significant. Right. So we're uh, talking margin. about, we're talking about the best. I, I would say you might argue with me on Giannis. I think he's the best defensive player. On the Bucks and, and Paul George certainly is on the, uh, on the Thunder for absolute elite defenses. And then, you know, you factor in, uh, kind of the, the way they stuff the box score. You know, Giannis is the best rebounding forward in the game. You know, he's a six assist a game guy. He's, he's putting up 20, you know, well, what, 27 or whatever per game. I mean, he's the most starting dominant. To hit th- starting to hit threes too. Yeah, the most dominant driving force in the league for sure. I mean, the, how how many off dribble dunks he has is just obscene, you know. And then they space the floor so well around and blah blah blah. Um, it was funny though. You you mentioned uh, you hit on Paul George's ISO numbers, point per possession. That's that's really good. What's Harden sitting at right now? I think it's more than that. I'd, oh, have, to, I'd, I'd have to look it up. I, it's significantly more than that. Let me see. I'll t- um, I can I can check right now for you, sir. Oh, that's yeah. Keep I know talking, last I'm year it was like last year it was like one point two two, which that, that that's an elite transition. No, he's a, he's at point nine eight. He's down to point nine eight now. Is he really? That yeah. shocks me. All right. Well, that, okay. I'm, I am impressed. I think. Am I doing that right? That doesn't seem right. No, I think this stat. I think sometimes the second spectrum tool screws up. It has him as only five isolations per hundred possessions. That's obviously not right. Oh, good uh, lord! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's five a quarter. Sometimes it does this, and you have to like reset it. And um, anyway, I'll check yeah. that later. Um, Giannis is so he's going to be the best player on the best team, and that is the default criteria for most the, people. The best player on the team has the best record, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and he he matches that. Um, you know what I just talked about? How people like to they like to vote for the guy who is is controlling the offense, who is running the offense, who's the focal point of the offense, and he matches that, and he's a good defensive player. So I think he checks a lot of the boxes. Um, Harden obviously checks the running the offense, controlling the offense box too. 
Um, well, I think Giannis also ch- kind of checks the narrative box, which we can't ignore. No, you can't. Um, you know, the, 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 the rising superstar hasn't won it. Best player on the team with the best record. Um, no disrespect to Chris Middleton, but the, the lone star on that team, I mean, Chris Middleton's an all-star. I understand that, but when you compare, you know, like Paul George has Russ. Uh, I, I would take either Capella, maybe Chris Paul still, over uh, over Middleton. You know, in terms of star power supporting cast, Giannis has the least, which in the MVP thing <laughs> is to his advantage. Harden, no, well, I'm going to push back on that in a second, but they just re- I just fixed it. It's Harden is at 1.15, you are right, which is about where he was last year, which is, again, yeah, that's, well, it, that's godly. It's that historically is, obscene. Yeah, that's not even, that's not a real thing. That's fake, um, but it's real. I read that plus 22 net rating thing for PG. The, th- the Thunder are a trash yeah. fire whenever he's not there. Here are the other candidates. Giannis, plus 13 with him on the floor, plus 3 off. So a total of about 10, 10.5. Um, so they're, they're a good team when he doesn't play. Um, yeah, but they're, <laughs> but they're, they're supremely right. good when he plays. And that, well, we'll get back to that. Harden, this is going to hurt him, and I don't think that's fair. Yeah. Harden is plus 3.6 on plus 1.1 off. So they tread water, total of only plus 2.5. And Bede is, is, um, also really high by this, actually second among this group behind only Paul George at about plus 13 gap. Um, so, you know, do this, this gets into these existential questions is like, well, do you punish Giannis because the Bucks built a really good team and have like 12 good players? And, and, and you may not think that Chris Middleton is a star and, and I don't think he's a star either, but Chris Middleton, Eric Bledsoe, Malcolm Brogdon are having like roughly equivalent, really good seasons. Like they're, they're going five or six deep in really good players. If not your yeah. typical second star guys, they've got like five third star guys and that's that's powerful. Um and and Harden, you know, given the skeleton crew they've been working with, their floor is 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 pretty low, I think. Or they maybe their the proper way to say it is their ceiling is pretty low. So do we hold that against him that he's only been able to quote lift them to plus 3.6 per 100 when he's on the floor? These are really hard questions to answer but i go back to you you nailed it talking about Giannis. that's a dominant figure that plus 13 and i think sometimes we forget when we look at we and i'm guilty of it too when we look at the mvp we tend to gravitate toward people who are carrying like a huge load on just an okay team and this is how mm-hmm. russ won right you know there's a we forget that like every win is incrementally harder to get so if you're the guy who takes a, a, what would be a 50 win team with a, a regular good player in your place and makes them a 60 win team. Those 10 wins are the hardest 10 wins to get in the entire league. Yeah. And, and you know, if we're going to go standings, if, you, if you're looking at standings that, you know, the Harden's also at a, at a disadvantage there, but I still say the historical nature of what he's doing combined with the efficiency, if the Rockets end up top four in the West, which, you know, they're right there right now. I just I would have a hard time voting for anybody else. I I um I don't know who I would vote for. I do th- I agree with you in this sense. I think if Houston finishes strong and he's averaging 35 a game, I just think the weight of history will be that he'll get it. Um yeah. now the the Bucks maybe win 66 games or something obscene like that and and that narrative flips a little bit, but um well they'd have to go they'd have to go like 24 and 2 to do that, so that's not going to happen. Um I just if, if uh, he keep, don't don't underestimate Miritich. Uh, what they they just keep getting deeper, man. They just keep I'm getting. You. They, they are they are and, really and, deep. and not only deeper, but deeper with guys who are great fits with Giannis. I mean, I, Brooke Lopez was the best bargain signing of the summer, I believe. Just a perfect fit on both ends with Giannis. Like his weaknesses, Giannis masks his strengths. You know, accentuate all of, all of Giannis's strengths. And then you know you add Miritich, and they can be. They can play so big. They can play small. They're always going to have shoot. I mean, like I said, they, they don't have a second star. But, you know, hey, the 2011 Mavericks really didn't have a second star. But they had a bunch of guys who were great fits around Dirk. And obviously Dirk and Giannis are totally different players. But I do think there's similarities in that this roster fits Giannis so well. Um, it, it's, it's going to be a heated 
MVP race. I mean, it's going to be, and I mean heated in the good sense and the bad sense. It's the it, the commentary around it is going to be heated. Um, the reactions to it are going to be heated. Um, and but I do think those three have separated themselves. I would probably mm-hmm. Embiid is maybe fourth, although you can Durant has a very underrated strong argument. But those three have separated themselves, and George has separated himself from the other guys below him to the point that it is a three-man race. It's not, well, maybe PG, you think about No, he's in the race. Subplot, and this and this will be the last thing, LeBron has not finished outside the top five in MVP voting since wow. 2005. He's been, he's been in the top five for whatever consecutive number of years that is. That's like 13 consecutive seasons in the top five, which is either a record or close. Um, and he's only fifth once. Uh, he was fourth a couple times, second, third, third, second, four-time MVP. I think, barring some crazy turnaround, this is going to be the first year since 2005 he doesn't make the final ballot. Well, and there's going to be a lot of things that are ending for LeBron this year. Obviously, the streak to the finals, uh, that's over. Um, perhaps even his streak of playoff appearances. Um, but, I mean, I, LeBron is still absolutely ridiculous, but... He's not even in the second tier of MVP candidates this year, in, in large part because of all the time he missed. But, you know, they're huffing and puffing in the All-Star break, sub-500, after just losing to the Hawks. You know, it's a uh, – MVP is, is not even, you know, he's not even in the conversation. Was he's he, was he the odds-on favorite at the beginning of the year? Was he the Vegas favorite? If it, he's if he, the guy who I pick every year, <laughs> you know, because he is still the best player in the league. Um, I, I don't know if he, I don't know what Vegas said, but he's the, like every year we have to do our preseason predictions. I say LeBron, you know, you're, you're going to be right fairly often on that. It's funny. Um, I said that on, on get up this morning, you know, because my, I, I continue to think that the Lakers should make the playoffs, that they have the talent to make the playoffs, that they just, and, and every time you think they've turned it around, not turned it around, but you know, obviously there was this trade deadline, um, yeah. fiasco. Okay. And that Indiana game, they laid down and died. And you thought, okay, they're in trouble. Then they go in Boston and beat the Celtics in a wonderful, improbable win. And you think, okay, they they figured something out. And then they lose to the Sixers. They, you know, the Sixers are good. They got this new starting five that's exciting, blah, blah, blah. Then they play a game like last night where they were completely clueless. I mean, that is a game, that's a game that makes you worry about Luke Walton. Because that was a game where, like, they had no plan defensively. They switched plans midstream a couple of times and they were a train wreck at anything they did. That's a problem. Um, but I still think, look, you're telling me if, if LeBron is the best player, okay, and I think it's assumed that he is. Now, Jalen Rose pushed back at me and said, I don't, I'm not sure he's the best player anymore. But the assumption is, okay, mm-hmm. so regular season LeBron does the chill mode, blah, blah. When the chips are down, yeah, he's the best guy. That's the assumption. Well, the chips are down now. This is the, this, these are playoff games for the Lakers. The chips are down. This is not the East. And if he's really the best guy and he wants to be the best guy and he can engage God mode for the next 20 games, they should make the playoffs. That's the most interesting subplot of the second half of the season. Or this, boy, whatever. Uh, could you imagine the Lakers as an eight seed? Lakers versus Warriors in the first round? How fun would that be? LeBron versus the Warriors? It, it, it's possible. I will say, though, let's not poo-poo the Hawks. The Hawks, now that the Kings are Scrappy. at least temporarily Scrappy. in the playoff picture— the, the, the Hawks have become my favorite sub-500 league pass team. Now, obviously, I live in Dallas, so the Mavericks aren't a league pass team for me. I see them all the time uh, with Luka Doncic. But, man, Trey Young is fun to watch. Yeah, he and he roasted uh, he roasted LeBron on a couple of drives yeah, late 14 in that assists. game last night. He, yeah, he yeah. nutmegged LeBron. Didn't get him he did, he did not, he he him. He did not make LeBron. I forgot about that. Yeah, the Hawks are fun. Um, John Collins is fun, and that you still need to. If you're a serious team, you still need to beat the Hawks on the road. All right, Tim McMahon. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. Tim McMahon, you got to go to um, get ready for Heat Mavs and and um, check up on on Dwayne Wade's cough. And of course, we all <coughs> we all know the irony of Dwayne Wade suffering a coughing fit against the Mavericks. In in I guess this isn't a high profile game, but. Um, well, you know. it's his last. It's his last visit to Dallas, and this is the one arena where I do believe D Wade will get booed on that hashtag One Last Dance tour. Oh, you think he switches jerseys with Dirk? Has to, right? You know, Even though there's well, been some well documented frostiness, as Dirk might say. <laughs> yes, as Dirk used that word with you, and he used it again the other night. When we asked. Dirk says he's willing. Which I think Dirk kind of bit his tongue and said, "You know, okay, you know, Dirk didn't want to." 
create any kind of scene. Um, this isn't the last time they play, though. The Mavericks still go to Miami in late March. And as far as, like, Dirk's unofficial farewell tour, that's a pretty special stop, too. Well, you got to figure the two jersey swaps are Doncic and Dirk. Um, so I would think so. One way or another, Dirk's getting a wager. He, he, he's already swapped with Tim Hardaway Jr. because there weren't a whole lot of options on the Knicks. <laughs> Now he could do Luke Cornett if they play. If he, if he needed to do another one, it might be Luke Cornett. Um, I, here's what I would do if I were Dirk. I would call the Heat and say, when we go to Miami, are you wearing the Miami Vice jerseys? And if so, I want to save the jersey swap for that game and not get uh-huh. – or maybe they're – I guess you can wear the Vice jerseys on the road too, but I think they tend to wear them at home more. I've, I can't keep track of who wears what anymore. It's too complicated. Well, I, I just know and, and appreciate your love for the Vice jerseys. I mean, there, there's really not much. I, I hope somebody one day loves me like you love those Miami Vice jerseys. I went. I bought. I bought one for for my. I have a Josh Richardson T-shirt for myself, and I bought a little Goran Dragic one for my daughter because you know she's Yugoslavian, <laughs> so we're close. She has a little Dragic there one. You she's go. gonna And she wants to wear a matching one. She said, "Daddy, I want to. Uh, can we match?" And I said, "Well, it's a little cold out right now for the T-shirts, but at some point." <laughs> we will be able to match and then everyone can laugh at Take it up. and go see a heat game. It'll, it'll be warm down there. Yeah, that's true. All right, Tim McMahon, thank you, sir. The work is outstanding as always. His profile of Harden and the gonads uh, was a really fun read, as is everything you write, Tim. Uh, thanks for the time and for the continued great work. Always a pleasure. Appreciate you having me.